morning and welcome to Lanier Church. We're delighted that all of you are here for worship today. This uh, has turned out to be a beautiful Sunday, has it not? Uh, I understand this afternoon we're going to get up into the mid-50s. This is a heat wave. <laughs> Thank you for being here today. We're so happy that you've come to worship. Please sign in. The attendance register is close to the center aisle there. And it helps us uh, know that you're with us in worship. I'm grateful that we started our confirmation class this morning. We had three bright students back there this morning. So I'm, uh, I'm happy that we're off and, and going for this year's confirmation group. They'll be joining the church on May the 22nd, which will be our Youth Sunday. So, so please keep that in mind. Uh, it's a normal schedule tonight for both the youth and the Promise Keepers. I want to say a word of special gratitude for last Sunday. We had a, a great time together in, in the groundbreaking, and so many of you did much preparation for us, kept things together, moving for us as, as the service went along. So I'm so very, very grateful to you. If you haven't seen some of the photos that Sylvia Williamson so beautifully did, uh, out in the narthex is the newsletter, a copy of it if you didn't get it online. So pick one up and, uh, and see there the, some of those photos. And then she's, she has made a, I guess you'd call it a collage, right? Out, uh, out on the table, and, and it too is, is fabulous. So Sylvia, thank you so much but what you've already done for us, and she says she's got more coming, so I'm, I'm just impressed. Thank you. Uh, I do want to uh, lift up to you that we've got three of our members are going to Costa Rica on a, a mission team on the 15th of, of February. We're glad that they're going to go down there and be building a church. You know, I've always felt that it, when we did construction in a, a church here in the States, it was really appropriate if we built something for others. And so you will note in the back of your bulletin today a picture of, of the church that they'll be working on, the roof, et cetera, I understand has some, some work yet to be done, uh, as well as some other items. So uh, Phil Eve, who's sitting back there in the, the back corner, will we'll be going on the trip, Ernest Craig and David Snipes are all going to be representing our church. I know some of you said you can't go on a trip like this, but you'd like to participate by, by helping the expenses of the trip. If you'd like to do that, simply mark your check Costa Rica, and uh, we'll make sure that it gets to that project for either travel expenses or, or for supplies that might be used down there. Uh, that camp is, is one that they've been working on now for about 20 years and uh, the church is, is new and it's one of the completing factors of that camp. So we're, we're grateful for an opportunity to uh, be a part of that. Again, welcome to all of you this morning. Let's join together now in, in singing our hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Let's stand together.
our faith together through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. join together now in a time of prayer first of all moments of silent prayer and meditation As you did inspire the wise men to follow the star, we sense that you call us to sail out of our smug harbors into uncharted waters of faith. You nudge us to wander from our predictable paths to follow you, to leave the comfort of the known to reach into uncomfortable spaces and share the gospel. As we live sometimes simple, sometimes crazy, sometimes unpredictable lives. Speak to us, Holy Spirit, of hope that is our anchor, peace which is our rock, grace that is our certain refuge. We pray this morning for our troubled world. We question what is to come. Are we on the precipice of war? Has diplomacy and the love of peace been abandoned? Be with the leaders of the nations of this world and inspire them to cling to the values of human life. Our prayers are with all of those who are ill today, whether they've contracted COVID or have other health concerns. Bring healing, Lord. Be with all who struggle with a wide variety of issues. You know their needs, Lord, and we ask your healing hand. Give us courage to go about our mission, your mission, O oh God. Inspire us to follow faithfully and to proclaim the message you've given us. As we are sent to serve, unite us with all your servants. In the prayer our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You know, I, I don't say thank you enough to you as a congregation for the way you support the mission and, and ministry of, of this church. We had another really good year last year, and we're thankful to you for your faithfulness 
and allowing us to, to do some things that we ordinarily wouldn't, wouldn't be able to do. We talk about uh, mission trips to Costa Rica and the church in Liberia, and we talk about Camp Wilson and some other activities that we're, we're involved in so much that you're a part of. And so I, I say thank you to you this morning. So remembering the words of our Lord, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Let us worship God with our tithes and our hearts.
to crochet. I'm not good. <laughs> so don't wait after yourself. So I have a little book. I have one thing of yarn because I practice. So I have little things that I've done. But it's really, I'm enjoying learning how to do it because I have time. To you think about it. So that's fun. Uh oh. I thought that was cute. No. Yes, well, me. I like a yoga shirt, too. But you know what else I like to do? I love to play games. That brings me a lot of joy. So I have this, but I just brought a card case because I didn't want to bring like a big game in my, in my bag because I figured that would be a lot. But so I brought some games. Isn't this a fun game? I love this game. Have you played this one? No. It's a good game. If you don't know it, get it. Anyway. Um, and then I do, you know, I have a puppy. He brings me joy. I, I've shown you guys pictures. I'm like, I don't have any pictures of my kids, but my gosh, I can show you my puppy. So, and then I have my Bible. Yes, this brings me joy. One thing I like to do, and most mornings, I do get it to it most mornings, I like to read the Bible a little bit. Um, and I like to spend some time with the Lord, and that brings me joy, because it gets me ready for the day. And God will just show me things. Like right now I'm reading the New Testament, and it's interesting when I just pull out just parts of the New Testament. So I'm really enjoying it. And, um, and that brings me joy, too. Now, are there all the things in the Bible? No. No, there's some bad stuff in here, too. But you know what? I love how God shows me things through the bad things. I love it. I think it's awesome. So this is where I get a lot of my joy. This is where I start my day. And our, in our, in our the scripture today, remember the Lord, um, in our scripture today, we're talking about that when, when Ezra is reading, he's one of the prophets, and he's reading the Bible, and everybody gets kind of like sad. And he says, don't be sad. We don't need to be sad. We need to be happy. This is God's word right here. We have God talking to us right here. It's amazing. This is the instruction booklet. We don't always you know, know what to do. Sometimes if we go to the Word, God will show us what to do, right? So we need to remember that. So these are some of the things that I just wanted to show you that bring me joy. And I want you guys to think about things that bring you joy, okay? All right, let's go ahead and say a prayer. Father, we are so grateful and thankful for all those things, Lord, that you give us daily that show us who you are. All those wonderful blessings from beautiful sunrises to... Uh, great parking spot to just having a friend show us that they care. Lord, we ask that you be with us this week. Help us to make the choices and help us remember no matter what we say and no matter what we do, you will always love us and always be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Scripture today is from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, 5 and 6, and 8 to 10. All the people gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could hear him with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So they read from the book, from the law of God with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and the scribe and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. 
and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Kim, and welcome to all of you, particularly to our visitors. We hope that you'll come and worship with us very, very often. Let's bow for a moment of prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. You know, as we get over into the, the latter part of, of January, it's interesting how the Super Bowl becomes a major focus in this country. While the playoffs continue today, the media is full of elaborate analysis of, of each qualifying football team. Hundreds of millions of dollars in advertising have been invested. This afternoon and evening, millions of fans gather around their televisions to, to watch the games. To some, emotional well-being comes becomes dependent upon the outcome of the game. Losing a game becomes losing in life to them. Winning to these same persons may mean winning in life. It's incredible. Yet after a short time, the outcome of the game and even the names of the participating teams are forgotten by all other than the most dedicated football fans. For instance, uh, let me illustrate. Can, can you remember who played in Super Bowl XXI? I do. That's when the New York Giants beat the Denver Broncos during that. You, you must have been in Sunday school this morning. <laughs> All right. But usually we, we can't remember who won, who lost, where the game was played. Where was the game played? Phil, do you remember where the game was played? The Rose Bowl. The Rose Oh, my goodness. And Hank Schramm was a quarterback for the Giants, okay? I'm impressed. Now what has all this conversation to do with the scripture from Nehemiah? Well, here we see the attention of an entire nation focused on a major celebration as we focus on the Super Bowl. They've gathered from, from towns throughout Israel and in one place, the water gate outside the, the temple in Jerusalem. They were there to celebrate events that defined their identity as people of God. They remembered the saving deeds of the Lord. But in the midst of this season of celebration, the thousands of people in Jerusalem cried when they heard the law of Moses read. What had happened? The people had returned from captivity in Babylon. And Ezra the priest read from the scroll of Moses' law from early morning until noon. The people began sobbing when they heard the, the commands of the law. Yes, it had been a long time since they could hear it read. But the deep emotion also had to do with how far they had drifted away from the ways of God. They wept for their sins. Ezra did, no doubt, understand their emotions, but he called them to a higher understanding of what that day required. He said, don't cry on such a day as this. This is time to celebrate with a hearty meal and to send relief to those in need. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. You must not be dejected and, and sad. You know, every once in a while we speak of, of Brother Lawrence, that saint of, of the kitchen. He found strength by serving and preparation of meals and, and clean up of the kitchen. One profound quote attributed to him was simply, joy is the surest sign of the presence of God. Don't you like that? Joy is the surest sign of the presence of God. 
Nehemiah voiced this memorable phrase under some remarkable circumstances. Jerusalem had been destroyed under the Persians in 586 BC. The temple was destroyed. The walls of the city were, were torn down. The gates burned. Thousands of people were, were transported to Babylon as captives and slaves. A generation went by and then another. As time went on, the children and grandchildren of the original captives and slaves rose to positions of responsibility in Persia. And Nehemiah was one of them. Nehemiah had spent all his life in Babylon, but his heart belonged to Jerusalem. He had never been there, but he knew the stories of his people. When he learned that Jerusalem still lay in, in ruin, he grieved. He asked the king of Persia, to whom he served as a cupbearer, for permission to go to Jerusalem along with some men to rebuild the walls. And the governor granted him permission and appointed Nehemiah as governor. The story of Nehemiah's return, how he and his co-workers rebuilt the walls, and a recounting of the obstacles and oppositions they overcame are recorded in the first seven chapters of the book of Nehemiah. What an amazing story it is. They worked without any heavy equipment. They were under the threat of attack constantly. Only half of the men could, could work at any given time. The other half had to, to stand guard so that the others could work. Often they held a, a spear in, in one hand while they worked with the other. Yet the entire building project was finished in 52 days. I've already challenged you at dealing with our, our project to see if we could make 52 days. It was a miracle. It was a miracle. In the face of such a miracle, now it was time to, to worship God. Ezra reads with the five scrolls of Moses. And when he finished, Nehemiah said to them, Go and enjoy good food and sweet drinks, and send some to those who have prepared nothing. This is a holy day. The joy of the Lord is your strength. What made Nehemiah such an effective leader? Well, first of all, he approached life with a positive attitude. This kind of positive attitude grows out of joy and reinforces joy in the heart of the believer. It's been said that a pessimist is someone who can look at the, the land of milk and honey and see only calories and cholesterol. Nehemiah could have been frozen in doubt in what some would call reality concerning Jerusalem. Yet he knew that with, with God's help, he would succeed. Jim Moore, who was a former pastor at St. Luke Church in Houston, tells a story about a woman who went to see her doctor with, with a long list of complaints. The doctor couldn't find anything wrong with her. And he suspected that the woman's negative outlook on life was, was her real problem. He got up from his desk and pointed to a shelf filled with bottles. And he said to her, look at those bottles. All of them are empty. I can take one of them and fill it with a poison. Enough poison to, to kill a human being. Or I can take that same bottle and fill it with medicine. Enough medicine to cure a headache or bring down a fever or kill bacteria. The important thing is I make the choice. I can fill each bottle with something harmful or something helpful. Then the doctor looked the woman straight in the eye and said, each day that God gives us is like one of those empty bottles. We can choose to fill it with positive thoughts that lift us and other people. Or we can fill it up with negative thoughts that depress us and, and everyone else. The choice is ours. As we hear the story of, of Nehemiah working against great odds and encouraging his men to persevere, we have to be impressed by his attitude that because God was with him, he would not be defeated. 
Now, Nehemiah had a positive attitude, but he also had a powerful purpose. All through the 52 days Nehemiah was rebuilding, his enemies were scheming to harm him. They sent him a message four different times. Let's meet together in one of the villages on the, on the plains of Omer. Nehemiah knew that they were trying to, to trap him. He sent messengers back with this reply. I'm carrying on a great project and cannot go down to you. And again, why should I stop to come to you? Nehemiah was speaking truth. He had a powerful purpose. There's an old story about the absent-mindedness of, of Albert Einstein, the brilliant mind, Nobel Prize winner. One day he was traveling by, by train, as was his custom. After he boarded the train, he couldn't locate his ticket. He checked his coat pockets and, his, and the pockets of his pants, nothing. About that time, the conductor came along and said, Dr. Einstein, what's the problem? He responded, I can't seem to find my ticket. And the conductor replied, I know who you are. You don't need a ticket. Well, a few minutes later, the conductor came back through the car and found Einstein on his hands and knees looking under the seats. Please, he said, Dr. Einstein, you don't need a ticket. I know who you are. Yes, I know who I am too, responded the famous scientist, but I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> it's a sad state of affairs when one doesn't know where he or she is going. The Welsh poet David White wrote, I don't want to have written on my tombstone when finally people struggle through the weeds and pull back the moss and read the inscription on it, these words, he made his car payments. Surely we need a reason for living beyond meeting a mortgage or a car payment. We need a purpose that gets us up out of bed and gets us going in the mornings. Unless we have a meaningful purpose for our lives, our lives are prone to not to have much zest or much happiness. The happiest people on earth are the people who have a godly purpose. Nehemiah termed it the joy of the Lord is our strength. Nehemiah knew the presence of God in his life. Here's where he got his positive attitude. From God came his great purpose. God was the source of his joy. He never got discouraged, never drowned himself in despair. God was present working through him. William Wilberforce was a British politician and philanthropist who was prominent in the struggle to abolish the slave trade and then to abolish slavery itself in British overseas possessions. As a young man, he was discouraged in the early 1790s after another defeat in his 10-year battle against slavery. Tired and frustrated, he opened his Bible and a small piece of paper fell from it. It was a letter that had been written by John Wesley shortly before his death. And Wilberforce read it once again. Wesley had wit written to him saying, unless the divine power has raised you up, I see not how you can go through this glorious enterprise in opposing that abominable practice of slavery, which is a scandal of the religion of England and of human nature. Unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you'll be worn out by the opposition of men and devils. But if God be for you, who can be against you? Are all of them together stronger than God? Oh, be not weary of well-doing. Go in the name of God and in the power of his might. Now hear those phrases of Wesley once again. Unless God has raised you up, if God be for you, be not weary in well-doing. Go in the name of God. Nehemiah had a, a positive attitude, a powerful purpose, 
and a sense of the presence of God. The joy of the Lord was in his soul. And therein was his strength. My friends, therein is your strength as well. The joy of the Lord. Let us pray. Oh God, we thank you for your servant Nehemiah and how he, he did put into focus for us how much the joy of being in you strengthens us. Lord, we sense your presence in our midst. We know that you have a, a purpose for us. Help us, oh God, to rely upon you to bring about that purpose. For we know in you is our strength and our joy. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Please stand and join us in our closing hymn, Shine, Jesus, Shine. <laughs>